Welcome to Empower Youth Finances, where we keep young people in the loop about money, about financial freedom, about financial success, financial confidence, security through financial education. Today, I am with a friend of mine, Lecha, and we're going to talk about the psychology of money. Or all things psychology, beliefs, values that we may take for granted, um, you know, but they do exist and they affect how we spend money. And before I actually call her to introduce herself, I'd like to read just a little paragraph from The Psychology of Money by, let's see, Morgan Ussel. Okay? Just the first page, this is only page 11. He says, Let me tell you about a problem. It might make you feel better about what you do with your money and less judgmental about what other people do with theirs. People do some crazy things with money, but no one is crazy. Here's the thing, people from different generations raised by different parents who earned different incomes and held different values in different parts of the world, born into different economies, experiencing different job markets with different incentives and different degrees of luck, learn very different lessons. Please introduce yourself <laughs> and why you are here. <laughs> and, and thank you for taking the time, by the way. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much for inviting me, Bisudzo. I yeah. think that this is quite something that you have started here. Thank you. Um, youth empowerment is absolutely number one, especially in the trajectory that we are in now. There's yeah. so much change looming, yeah. and the best person to keep informed and empowered is precisely youth. Mm. <laughs> but you had asked and me you to are introduce you as well, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. So I young am. people doing the most out here. I mean, I know you're one of these young trailblazers who are like pushing and pushing and pushing. And so, tell us more about yourself and your push and your your victories and your failures and you yes, know anything yes. that you can share. Thank you so much um, for that. So, like you mentioned, Kibira Lecha Kotla, I am a counselor by profession and qualification. Mm -hmm. However, I find myself dabbling in multiple spaces mm -hmm. uh, since I joined the workforce. And this is because I am passionate about many things at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I think top of the list is education. Yeah. Um, education and particularly wellness education. I think for a long time we have created learning programs that mm -hmm. have been independent from wellness and yeah. that that has now we are starting to see the ripple effects of that we're starting to see the gaps mm. of not including wellness education in our formal education and a part of that includes the high statistics yeah. of poor mental health includes the way that we see people relating with their money um, so this is part of the work that i have dedicated my life to do um, helping people draw the connection mm. between the emotions and the general quality of their lives. Okay, just for someone who may not actually know, what is wellness though? I mean, why, why, why do we take it for granted mm. that it's, it's not a, a concept to teach and have people practice? I think it was taken for granted for a number of reasons yeah. and I'll borrow from your introduction mm. that you gave that we grew up in different contexts, different cultures, mm. different, um, a lot of things, right? Yeah. So I think when we were introduced to the formal education system that we operate from now, mm. um, we were coming from a culture that was much more well-rounded than the one that we have now. Remember that we used to be a culture that was very family and community based. Mm -hmm. yeah. That means that we spent time around people, yeah. around different age groups of people. Mm. You'd have your siblings who are younger than you, older than you. You'd have Bumalome. Um, mm -hmm. or you relate with them on a different level yeah. um, then you have your parents and then you have wisdom from your grandparents so 
I don't so much think that we took it for granted. Mm. However, I feel like when we, or I think that, yeah. <laughs> I think it's more formal. Yeah. I think that when we changed systems, we didn't realize yeah. that we yes. were moving away from something that we really, really needed. Yeah. But wellness is basically the ability to cope well with mm. life's um, challenges, okay. circumstances. Because yeah. by now we all know that life is pretty difficult. <laughs> it can be so difficult and, and, and most of the time it is difficult when we don't have money, mm. when we don't have finances to live life. Exactly. I mean, some people say, there's some people argue the statement, money makes the world go round. Mm. Like, oh no, but money doesn't make you happy. And mm. some of us were like, no, no, but I'd rather, you know, have loads of it and still be, you know, yeah. right, than not. Yes. Um, and we called you actually today, and thank you for your introduction. So I, I can, and, and, and obviously, you know, we can connect the dots as, as to why we can even link money to wellness mm. or link money to any mental health link money to our physical health mm. link money to our spiritual health mm. so with that in mind can you just talk to us about uh, money beliefs that we that we may have mm. money values or principles that we may have mm. that may shape our relationship with money or that that is shaping our relationship with money <clears throat> whatever you have observed as mm. a counselor what have you observed in our society when it comes to the beliefs we have and how they affect our relationship with money? I think there's lots of codependency mm -hmm. um, in individual relationships with money. Mm -hmm. I've observed this because usually when you sit down with an individual yeah. and speak about money, speak about their financial status, mm. they always um, tend to bring somebody else. <laughs> what does codependency mean? Uh, codependency means a relationship that way um, you are heavily reliant uh -huh. on somebody else or something else. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, continue. So a lot of um, us here, Mohozwana, we have that kind of relationship mm -hmm. with about our financial freedom. Um, we think that, or we give a lot of power um, to the organizations we work for, mm -hmm. to our spouses, mm -hmm. to our circumstances, and that kind of breeds a lot of stagnation around um, around our financial freedom in general because yeah. we don't I, don't, I don't see us pushing um, for what we really have the potential to push for mm -hmm. and a lot of that has to do with um, us depending or relying on external uh, forces and circumstances. Mm. Okay, so and, and, and I guess young people taking just the economic uh, landscape mobile to mm. it is then not surprising that most of us are actually dependent mm. on our parents mm. sometimes until you are in your 30s mm. uh, we're dependent on our partners mm. uh, sometimes even in abusive relationships we we actually had a, a conversation with Medi Jane mm. uh, she's a pensioner but she's still working but mm. she's a pensioner and we call her a pensioner because she decided at 45 or thereabout to go and retire early and take and then cash early mm. her money. Um, but her financial, as we listen to her story, her financial journey was affected by a life partner that she, she, she lived with, mm. right? A boyfriend and not even a husband. Mm. So you can see that the, the codependency that you're speaking to, yeah. we can actually observe even in that yeah in that story and it comes from a young age like you mentioned yeah. first we are our parents we depend on our parents yeah then we depend on allowance mm. um, if we are fortunate enough to go to tertiary school then we mm. depend on our employers mm. and that should never be the case um, recently I did a, a group financial empowerment session mm. for one of our biggest uh, organizations in the country mm. and one thing we came to highlight is that Whatever organization that you work for, mm. um, whatever industry, whatever your qualifications are, who you are, uh, that organization is not responsible for your financial freedom. <laughs> no. They have a mandate yeah. that they have set up to fulfill. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that is what they're driving for. They will yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, 
compensating you with the salary at the end of every month. Mm. But when it comes to your financial goals, that's your individual responsibility. Mm. And I think that that is where the a lot gets lost. Yeah. We don't thread um, the responsibility that far. Mm. We don't see that uh, really um, it comes to initiative and a lot of us don't really show it. Yeah. So, but then for someone who earns 1.8, mm. can they still set financial goals mm. and save some money? Mm. Last time we spoke about how Warren Buffett started saving and investing at the age of 10 or 12. Mm. So in our case where the, the only money that you will get is when you are going to tertiary and you're getting an allowance or doing internship, mm. can someone really save something from 1.8? 1.5 um, well when it comes to finances or personal finance there are really three money issues that mm -hmm. usually come up it's either you have an income problem okay you either have a spending problem or a debt problem income so an income problem spending a spending problem or a debt problem and debt yes. Okay. So what you just described is an income problem mm -hmm. where you are earning money and clearly it's not enough to yeah. cover your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I have a personal experience, something like that. Mm -hmm. When I was younger or all my life, mm -hmm. um, I've always been quite enterprising, uh, curious about business and just, I think, I don't know how, but I kind of understood the power of mm -hmm. money from a really young age. Yeah. I knew that money is very empowering from a young age. <laughs> yes. I used to, I remember uh, when I was in primary school, I have an older sister and we used to receive the same amount of pocket money. Mm -hmm. um, so one time our mom picked us up from grandma's house and she lives in extension 10. So mm -hmm. there's that complex where pick and pay is now. It used to be score. South Ring. Yes. Yes. <laughs> South Ring yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be score. Mm -hmm. So I got out of the car and they've always had pep in the corner. there. It's still mm -hmm. there now. Yeah. Um, and I got out of the car and I went to buy myself a box of pencils. And when I got back in the car, my sister complained to me, where's mine? Thinking <laughs> that I had been given money by mom, ah, but I yes. had saved the money for myself. I digress though. I wanted to get to um, this experience. Mm. Um, when I was a student, I had my daughter mm. when I was 22. Mm. And my relationship with her father was a bit estranged. So I understood by then that a lot of the responsibility to take care of her was my own. Yeah. So I had to stretch that 1.4 between myself, taking mm -hmm. care of myself, uh, getting myself to school and taking care of a newborn baby. Oh, wow. And newborns are quite expensive. Yeah. So I quickly figured out that this isn't going to work. So I needed uh, an alternative plan. So I started selling sandwiches nice. um, at school. And I can say that that made a big difference. I had an income problem. <laughs> and then the you time. found it, you made a plan. And then I made a plan. So I hope that that answers your question yeah. to say that uh, when you have an income problem, it means that you need to look look to your resources and see uh, what talents you have, uh, what resources you, you can utilize yeah, yeah. to increase your income. I, I love that. I, I think, you know, identifying the problem mm. and then dealing with the problem actually helps you. Mm. It actually helps you come up with a solution. So you didn't just sit there and say, oh, I'm just going to be poor here and, you know, deal with my 1.4 mm. and maybe take my child to my parents and, yeah. then, and then continue being this young adult. But mm. instead you are like, it's an income problem and I'm going to deal with it. You were not emotional about it. You were not, you know, dramatic about it. So now let's say now you have a spending problem. Yes. How would you deal with a spending problem? What would you say to a youth dealing with a spending problem? I think it comes down to discipline, being intentional about yeah. uh, your, your financial goals. Mm. Because I've found that a lot of the time when people spend money, um, without necessarily considering uh, it, when people create the habit of spending money, yeah. it usually is because they don't really have anything else to do with it. Uh-huh, yeah. yes. More banana you know. Hey, YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> so actually was saying that if you don't have plans for your money, you are going to finance the brilliant ideas of your friends, brilliant ideas of your family members, brilliant and some not so brilliant ideas of just of life, of, of, business of yourself, of the you. business people around you. Mm. Yeah, before we continue, just, just take a quick break and then we continue our conversation. Great stuff. Yeah? <laughs> cool, we'll be right back. Welcome back 
to empower youth finances. Today we are looking at the psychology of money. We are looking at all things, emotions and beliefs, principles and values that we have that may affect or influence our financial decision making and behaviors. And I am with Lecha. And before we went to our quick break, mm -hmm. uh, forced in a way by the doorbell, <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about the spending problem and how that actually affects um, how, how we spend money and yeah. particularly as you were speaking of how at 22, you, you actually had a, an income problem. Mm. You had a baby that you had to take care of, mm. but you didn't sit there by yourself and say, I don't have money. You made a plan. You were selling sandwiches. Mm. Um, and I'm sure, you know, having a responsibility like a beautiful child, you know, affects your spending. Yeah. Um, and we we're just talking about how young people and even just adults actually mm. have a spending problem. Yeah. More, more, more done. So yeah. please continue from there. Um, I think the idea is rooted around the thinking or the principle that money is a tool. Mm. And if you look at money in that manner, then you will understand that you have to have objectives and yeah. goals okay. for whatever money you come by. And this is important because if you don't plan for your money, or generally, there's a saying, if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. Yeah. And the same with money. If you don't create an intentional plan mm -hmm. for your money, then mm -hmm. it becomes very difficult for you to use it in yeah. a way yeah. that is empowering for you. Yeah. So I think it's also important to uh, highlight that the lack of an income problem mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily make you uh, not susceptible or proof mm -hmm. to a spending problem yeah. because you can have enough income but then spend um, in an exceeding manner to right. your income right and that quickly leads you down uh, the road to debt but we'll get there later yeah. Uh, spending problem really is where you don't have that financial discipline, where you don't have financial goals and therefore you don't uh, spend your money in a way that you're using it mm -hmm. um, to empower you in future yeah. or even in the moment. Because once you set goals for your money, mm -hmm. then you know exactly what you want to do with it. I think back to um, the story that I just narrated now yeah. that um, though it I had surplus money and I was able to reasonably meet the needs um, that I had at the time. Mm -hmm. However, I, I didn't start from a point where I had a plan to say, yeah. um, this is my budget. Um, during the time is when I started mm -hmm. uh, doing that, realizing that I'd make money, but then sometimes I'd spend even into stock. Mm. Then because I was living at home, you know, yeah. I borrowed to me to, to <laughs> <laughs> just to get business back up yeah. again. So it's important uh, to use specific tools if you want to avoid having a spending problem. Okay. So, and, and I, I like how you highlighted the fact that, you know, if you don't have goals, mm -hmm. you don't set goals for your money or have a plan for your money, mm -hmm. you won't really know where your money is going. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody actually was saying that if you don't plan for your money, your money is going to just wander around. Yeah. It becomes like a ghost, you know, like ghosts are just like hovering yeah. over the place. So you spend it on alcohol, you spend it on food, you spend it on uh, on friends, you spend it on family without actually having a target or of where it is going. Yeah. Okay. And you actually mentioned an issue of debt. Mm. And actually you also highlighted the, that you can actually have lots of money. Mm. And if you don't have a plan for it, mm. it's also just going to disappear. Mm. You may actually find yourself living beyond your means mm. and, and you can't track it until now you are at zero or at negative. Mm. What about the debt problem? It starts um, with what you just described, mm. that, uh, you know, the pressures could come from many things. Uh, sometimes it's just how people perceive you, mm -hmm. that they know that you work for a certain blue chip company, therefore uh, you are definitely making bank yeah. and that kind of switches the expectations. Making bank, is, is, that a, is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> is that a generation Z expression? I've never heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> it simply means you're earning reasonably. Nice. Yes. Okay. So, um, just because people perceive you like that, mm -hmm. it can be tempting to keep up with that experience, that expectation, and you end up spending money recklessly mm -hmm. um, on things that you don't necessarily need. And it isn't always the case that you're spending on other people. Sometimes you're spending on yourself. Yeah. Uh, you go get a personal loan, and you don't get it for any specific reason. But why do they call it personal? 
They call it personal because it is not tied to any specific endeavor. Once the bank gives you that money, you are free to do whatever you want yeah, with it. Okay. And you are not free. <laughs> <laughs> You've tied yourself to the bank now, exactly. right? Yeah. But once you have a pay slip, um, you're able to go there and check or qualify la bukai. Yeah. And usually people get that money and they spend it without a plan of how they're going to return it. And that's how the debt problem mm. uh, traditionally starts, mm. uh, where you have spent other people's money, mm. uh, the bank's money, but you don't have a plan for how you're going to return it. Yeah. But because you're earning reasonably, it yeah. isn't really... A, an issue, you know, you're making fifty thousand a month, five thousand daily. Mm. Yeah, I can give it to the bank, but you don't realize that um, because of your status, mm -hmm. um, certain parts of your life will also want to elevate at the same time. So if you have a seven-year-old like me, you want her to go yeah. to a specific school, you want to drive a certain car. That pressure, though. Yeah. How can we deal with that pressure? Um, <laughs> that requires a lot of emotional intelligence yeah. um, and also having discipline uh, to follow goals. Mm. But it also requires vision because you can have discipline but end up just being frugal. Mm. And it, it, okay, I tell people to be frugal. Mm. Is, is there any, can we talk about frugality that's mm. like maybe on the extreme? Yeah. And can we also talk about frugality that's actually like normal, mm. frugal, you're saving hale le hale on a plane in two minutes also stingy in two minutes yeah mm. um i'm not too sure about what <laughs> what we perceive as extreme yeah but i do think that a frugality should be coupled with intention okay i don't see the value in saving money for no reason mm -hmm. uh, money is a tool mm -hmm. and it should be used to empower yeah. um, yourself and the people whose lives you mm -hmm. influence so it's very important uh, that as you are frugal you're doing it for a reason otherwise you're just going to keep stashing money away yeah. and this is a Tool. It's like when you stash food away, mm -hmm. with it expires. food, it expires quicker. But yeah. when you think about uh, things like inflation, uh, buying power, money also kind of Reduce. expires as yeah, well. It expires. Yeah. So it's important that you set goals so that you keep up mm -hmm. with the economy and also work your way to freedom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you spoke about emotional intelligence, and, and mm -hmm. I, I really hope that you know young people, you. You underline this lesson that money is a tool. And it's a tool that you can use for good, for bad, for fun. But if you are a long-term thinker, you'll start looking at money differently. Um, and you'll start planning for it uh, differently. And that takes emotional intelligence that she has spoken about. So can we actually then maybe just wrap up this, this part here mm. and talk about the emotional attachments that we have and how... Um, how and why do emotional reactions such as fear, greed, envy, and guilt yeah. influence our financial decision making? Okay. Yeah. Allow me to play devil's advocate. Sure. A little bit here. Sure. I want to draw from our traditional wealth system. Okay. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And we still find a lot of our, uh, our parents. Um, those lucky to still have their grandparents yeah. al alive uh, still do the subsistence uh, farming thing. Mm. Um, they call it commercial, but it isn't really because <laughs> we don't often see um, yeah. And that's a, a good example of emotional attachment to mm. money because essentially those resources should be used to empower you. Right. But instead, um, what we usually see, yeah. um, and there's costs involved in yeah. that as well. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. um, there's feeds. So there is an investment. Yeah. And, you know, with any business endeavor, you'd expect an ROI. Mm -hmm. um, but because of that emotional attachment to the resource, it makes it very difficult mm -hmm. for us to be able to multiply uh, the assets or see any... Um, see any return yeah. from that investment. So that is a typical example of how emotions can get in the way mm. of us making good financial decisions. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like that. I, I like the example I do home because yeah. I think it is actually in every single 
you know, what's on a family somewhere. Mm. <laughs> Especially some of us, you know, we, we, we know, mm. we know that experience. And Tukomo is one example. Yeah. Yeah. As well, as well. As well. At Ayang, instead of actually giving more, so yeah. you're just putting and putting and putting in, but return on investment. Mm. I guess it's the emotions, how the emotions. how they feel instead yeah. of feeling guilty to sell or feeling um, some kind of I don't know, pride, fear, and well. pride mm. as well to mm. you know to have a head mm. um, instead of thinking of okay, how can this asset mm. really bring me money mm. that can actually lead me to financial freedom. And we do it when we spend as well. Yeah. Um, thus having terms like moreik. <laughs> moreik. Moreik. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a self-esteem thing. It's an ego thing where mm. people kind of uh, buy respect, mm -hmm. uh, buy a sense of significance mm -hmm. using their money. So when I step within the place, I want you to know what time it is because I am the one <laughs> buying drinks for yes. everyone. I am the one, you know, because it's like a level ice boy, you know, everybody yes. does things for me because I have the money. But yeah. that typically will get in the way of your financial goals. I remember, sorry to cut you, I remember during COVID there was a video running, you know, during rounds on, mm. on, on social media about this guy who was, who had gone to sell, to buy, mm. I think it was a club, I think there's an alcohol called Perry something. Don Perry. Don Perry. <laughs> and how he said, Don Perry. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, the emotion yeah. in how he feels so proud mm. having spent that amount of money on that mm. Don Perino thing. That's true. And yeah. that's how a lot of us become susceptible to black tax as yeah. well. Um, because I was saying to somebody the other day that, um, you know, when we have the capacity to support people, mm. we also have the capacity to create capacity for the people who mm. we want to support. But usually we stop at just giving them the fish instead yeah. of teaching them how to fish yeah. because of that codependency, because that codependency makes us feel relevant. Mm. And these are some of the emotional issues that we see coming up when it comes to money issues. You know, as we talk about this now, it, it leads me to asking about, can we, can we talk about money wounds and financial mm. trauma? Mm. And I think to give you a, more time to, you know, freely speak before I cut you and go for a break. I think let's take a quick one. Mm. And then when we come back, we'll look at what money traumas are, what yeah. financial trauma is, mm. and how we can heal those money wounds that we mm. may be suffering from, mm. um, influenced by experiences, mm. whether from childhood, growing up, being with friends, or just living this Generation X life, right? Yeah. yeah. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Empowered Youth Finances. Today we are looking at the psychology of money, all things emotions, beliefs, values. Why do we spend money the way we do? How do we do it? What really influences our financial decision making? I'm Ode Lecha, um, and she has broken down all sorts of concepts and how um, how we spend money is linked to our emotions, it is linked to our beliefs, it's linked to um, the, the, the emotions that we feel, whether it's fear, it's pride, whether it is, can even be envy, you know, seeing mm. someone do something, you're like, oh, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, keeping up with the Joneses. Joneses, yes. yes. Um, and, and we're trying to actually get you to recognize that and to stop yourself so that you don't find yourself at retirement age without finances. Um, and we, we, we just wrapped up the, the, the last part where I was asking you about money wounds and mm. financial trauma. Yeah. Can we talk about money wounds and financial trauma and what, what, are, what, what are those okay. and how do they come about? Right, so I want to talk about that twofold. Mm. Um, the first part will be the miseducation yeah. that a lot of people experience about money mm. or surrounding money issues. Growing up, we get an impression of what money is and how money works mm. from our primary caregivers, from our 
education, from things like that. Mm -hmm. And whatever idea is given to us from those formative stages, we tend to carry them forward yeah. um, until a point where we realize, if we realize, if we have this self-awareness to realize <laughs> you need that, that. <laughs> yeah. the principle that we're carrying is wrong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can create a wound, that can create um, the wound where we just have never been able to relate mm. uh, with money properly. We are role modeled uh, to think of wealth in a certain way. And we see this uh, a lot in locations mm. uh, where the idea of wealth is basically a BMW, mm. um, a light-skinned girlfriend, mm. what's, um, what's the, I mean... a big phone. <laughs> <laughs> what is that about? <laughs> um, and these are just examples. Hey? It's not yeah. a, a standard formula. It, I think it, it's different depending on um, the the area, mm -hmm. but the idea is that um, there's there's ideas. Mm -hmm. People influence each other about what wealth is, and that's what people strive for. Yeah. Um, and when a young person interacts with such um, information, it can then you know shape the way that they're going to deal with money, mm -hmm. and they can find themselves making terrible decisions yeah. um, later, regretting them, and that becoming a money wound. Mm -hmm. Now the second part is here. Mm -hmm. where we trap ourselves in cycles of uh, poor spending and that also is attached to our mental health. Yeah. Why? Because when we spend money poorly, it... Um, it arouses a sense or, or it, it, it puts us in a state where um, we start to feel anxious mm -hmm. about money and about our spending in general. Um, and when we're feeling anxious, this makes us a bit desperate mm -hmm. about the decisions that we make with money. Mm -hmm. um, that's one part. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is that um, when we feel anxious, we tend to spend money without clearly thinking about yeah. it. And this is how scammers win. <laughs> I I was uh, a victim. Yeah. But I am ashamed to say. <laughs> and in But your yeah. experience, you'll yeah. realize that your your mind at the time, yeah. the space that you were in mentally, mm. was high pressure, high octane, yeah. anxious. Yeah. And that's what usually gets us to buy things impulsively. Mm -hmm. And once we've made the buy, this could be a scam mm. or this could be something that we think will gratify us. We go out, uh, we're not feeling okay, so we go and buy food or we go buy new clothes. Mm. And what we're going for really is that instant gratification. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to feel a little bit better. But then that fizzles out and you go right back. In fact, before anxiety, again, you experience guilt. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. by uniform, all of this. So all that guilt mm. then returns you to where you started being yeah. anxious. And the cycle repeats itself like that. So in just in short, so that Babaskabarabolella along things, how do we heal money wounds? We how can we heal all these things that come to inflict a wound? Mm. Yeah. We need education. Okay. We need information. The Bible says my people will perish for the lack of knowledge. Yeah. And that's exactly where a lot of gaps are. We don't know what we don't know. Mm. And we need to be able to empower ourselves to know yeah. the right things. And this involves also your your emotional processing, uh, your mental health as well, mm -hmm. because the two are interconnected. Yeah. We cannot divorce our uh, ability to be or we cannot divorce our capacity for emotional intelligence mm. uh, from the way that we behave with yeah. money. That's why some people have an alum ID. We walk different. <laughs> our, we float. Different. But, but yeah. so, you know, yeah. when you have money, though, it feels good. Mm. Like even when you sleep, you can sleep deeper. Mm. Well, at least I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. Um, and and when and I feel sorry for people who who don't have mm. because I can just imagine the emotional turmoil mm. they must be in, you know, mm. thinking about what to what to buy, where to buy it, mm. how much is going to cost, but you don't have the money. Mm. Um, and um, but for me, the way I live my life, I, I believe in delayed gratification. Mm. 
a lot. Mm -hmm. And it has saved me from so many emotional traumas, except that one particular scammer thing that I fell for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, th I think it was also a lesson for me mm -hmm. that sometimes you, you can also... Uh, I think even, you know, being scammed was a trauma response because I was thinking about, you know, if I could just make this amount that is mm. being said I'll make, mm. it will, you know, relieve me of so many res other responsibilities mm. that are on my table. Mm. And unfortunately, it was a scam, so yeah. I lost even more. Yeah. But maybe if, if I could actually figure out, how, okay, how do I take that money and build capacity of someone mm. so that they can actually then make money mm. like using like proper routes yeah um i could have you know mm. and you'll see that um the way that these scams are crafted is they people they, they people who design them mm -hmm. <laughs> develop them curate them yeah they uh they're quite smart because they play yeah. on people's emotions yes um the concept of instant gratification yeah the concept of effortlessness mm. the concept of you know you can sit back and and you hear yeah, the catchphrases are usually the same uh instant mm. um you don't have to work a day uh you know it it's it's arousing those emotions where yeah. people feel like this is really easy yeah. and that's how they attract people to mm. to uh, to invest in those kinds of things yeah mm. so to heal these wounds mm. financial education you say yes, is very important yes. um and maybe to some extent as well just you know seeking help to those who can help you you know make help you move your money mm. using registered yeah structures and institutions true right however that's secondary yeah um they say personal finance is 80% behavior mm -hmm. and only 20% knowledge. Yeah. So you do need the knowledge, but if you don't have the discipline to follow the plan, <laughs> then yes, you usually wind up in the same place you started. Yeah. So wellness um, education is also uh, an integral part of gaining financial freedom yeah. because without it, then you're not able to stick to, you're not able to avoid uh, the temptations. You're not able to stand strong mm -hmm. against uh, people trying to play on your emotions. And it's not just scammers, uh, even retail stores, yeah. the way that they design their sales, uh, the words that they put out, 50% of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, shopping online. Mm -hmm. Also, you'll see three for it. Two. Three for two. Um, although some of them are a bit beneficial. <laughs> they are but, actually some. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say something's on promotion and they put a timer on it, once yeah. in a lifetime opportunity. And if you don't have uh, the emotional strength to resist such things, yeah. you might find that all the time, my diana, ahui veidahala, without doing anything productive for yourself. And you know, um, I think your work mm -hmm. actually helps people figure out emotional things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Their own psyche, why they behave the way they do, mm -hmm. what could be influencing them. Can they get some help from you? Can mm -hmm. you guide people accordingly? Certainly. Yeah. Um, at Ether, mm -hmm. uh, my institution, Ether Institute, we do offer financial counseling uh, and also wellness education. We do this through learning programs mm. that are wellness education based. So if you want to learn about emotional intelligence, yeah. uh, manage your stress, understand the psychology of spending, yes. uh, this we are uh, certainly your go-to persons because, uh, like I was saying earlier, when you have more information, you're able to help yourself, empower yourself, because it really comes down to your behavior, yeah. what you do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Because when, once you change the things that you do, you start feeling different. And that feeling empowers you to trust yourself mm -hmm. and continue down a path where you're doing great things for yourself. Yeah. So that is what we try and drive for with our education learning programs. Mm -hmm. uh, our corporate learning and development programs are based around that, creating human resource that is self-sufficient, that yeah. is empowered so that they're able to not only withstand life's challenges but also become a lot more productive mm. in the workplace. Well, well, do check them out. 
And if you want to read more about the psychology of money, you can actually look up this book by Morgan Husserl. If you want to know about money in general and just financial education, check out also Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki, especially if you're a young man who wants to be, or a young woman who wants to start business and do business, understand the money and how cash is king and why it is. If you want to know more about land, because we've been talking about land um, as well the past couple of ep episodes, we had Ray Gilbert Senior here before. He also has a book that explains a lot about land and how, and how one can derive wealth from, from our land. Now, just in conclusion, what are two or three things that you want young people to take from this conversation moving forward? I hope young people uh, understand the importance of setting financial goals yeah. and understand the link between their emotions and their behavior around mm. money. Most of the time, um, pe young people um, have this saying that, you know, I make a budget, but I just don't know what happens at yeah. the end of the month. And some of these gaps can be... Um, can be helped by getting to understand yourself better, getting to understand your behavior better so that you're able to get a better grasp on discipline. And mm. once you have the discipline, you're empowered to fulfill your financial goals. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And that's it for us for today. I hope this has been empowering to you. See you next time. <laughs>